Okay, uh, this lesson today is on the uh, carbon footprint of uh, producing enough steel uh, for your very first car. And uh, we're going to go through and take a look at where we would get the raw materials to make the steel, as well as uh, some basic chemistry behind uh, making the steel. I've uh, posted up some um, good YouTube videos to go along with this lesson so that uh, um, you can actually physically see uh, what's happening in a uh, smelting factory and a processing factory and uh, see some uh, some people in their backyard making some steel in, uh, in their own very own blast furnace. Now, uh, where does steel, what is steel and where does it come from? Well, uh, one of the most important things to know is that steel is an alloy. So we can see some steel over at the side here, some steel rods, and they look pretty shiny. What we have to rec what we have to know about steel is steel's probably about 95% uh, to 98% uh, iron. So in terms of element, it's uh, it's primarily iron, but steel's also got a little bit of carbon in it, and that allows steel to get actually its strength. It has just the right amount, usually between 0.2 and 2 percent uh, carbon by weight. Most most steel that we use is around 1 percent, 1.5 percent carbon by weight, um, and that allows it to have its strength. If it didn't have the carbon in it, it wouldn't. Uh, it would be too soft, and you wouldn't be able to use it for the um, the things that we use steel for. Now, where does steel come from? Well, steel. Uh, we don't just find the iron lying around on the ground. It's actually found in rocks, and we call these uh, rocks ores. And the main ore. Uh, that we find iron in uh, that we use especially to make steel is hematite uh, ore and um, the form that which we find iron in is what we see right here Fe3 Fe203 so it would be uh, uh, an iron oxide um, in this case, an iron three oxide. Now, there's different uh, different types of ores, but we're just gonna, for our purposes, we're gonna stick to a simple one right here. So, what happens? We need to take our hematite um, and convert it into something uh, that's useful. So, we start with the rock, and we end with steel rods or steel ingots or uh, blocks of steel that can then be melted and fashioned into whatever form we want later on becoming the frame of your first car. So what's the carbon footprint? How much carbon dioxide does it require to get this? Well once we've dug the ore out of the ground we have to get rid of the oxygen. So we can see right here that we've got these nasty oxygen atoms stuck onto our iron. We need to get rid of those. Um, through this process we'll have a little bit of carbon mixed in but it's not chemically mixed in the same way the oxygen is bonded to the iron um, like we see here. Um, so what we need to do is get rid of that oxygen. The best way to do it is in a blast furnace with really high temperatures and we need a lot of charcoal or graphite or, uh, or coal even, any major source of carbon. And uh, and you can even do this if you had clay bricks. You could do the same thing in your backyard. Um, so if we have a source of carbon, what's going to end up happening is the carbon is going to remove the oxygen and will create carbon dioxide. And then we'll be left with our iron, which is what we want at the end. So when we want to determine the amount of ox of carbon dioxide we actually produce we can use this chemical formula to go through and figure that out now we have a chemical equation here we have to remember some basic rules the rules that uh, were first discovered by uh, people like Joseph Priestley um, and, uh, and John Dalton uh, discussed these later on, things that we've learned from grade 9, is that in a chemical reaction, matter cannot be created or destroyed. And any chemical reaction that occurs 
occurs where the reactants and products are reacted or produced in fixed ratios. Uh, just like how the elements in a compound like carbon dioxide here are always set in a fixed ratio, one carbon to two oxygen. So before we go any further, before we start theorizing about how much iron we would need and things like that, we need first to fix this equation. We need to balance this equation out so that we have the right ratios of reactants, both reactants and both products. Only then can we go and start to determine specific amounts of our products that we're going to produce. So I look here, I've got two iron uh, atoms on this side. I only have one iron atom on this side. Typically when we balance equations, we start to balance our metals first. Um, and then we go to our non-metals. Well, I've got one carbon here, one carbon there. That looks good. Two irons, probably on the right track. Till I get to my oxygen. See, I've got three oxygens here. Um, and, I, and I have two here. I've got an odd number on my reactant side. I have a uh, simple rule when it comes to uh, dealing with odd numbers of uh, things like oxygen and hydrogen because they are usually so important. Whenever you have an odd number of something important like oxygen or hydrogen, their best bet right off the bat is to double. Put a two in front. Um, of that uh, compound. By doing that it makes everything even um, and that usually fixes everything else uh, through the chemical equation. So now we have to go back and make some changes. So I have two um, iron uh, three oxide um, compounds here. That's what this two in front means. But in terms of iron atoms I have two times two I have four so now I'm going to have to go back and fix this up. So I have four iron atoms, those two uh, balance out. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, work my oxygen here. Typically I do my non-metals but uh, it'll probably be a little quicker if I figure out my oxygen. I have two times three which gives me six oxygens on the left side of the arrow. I need six oxygens now on the right side. So in order to have six oxygens, I have to put a three in front of my carbon dioxide. Three times two gives me six. Now I can go back and finish off my carbon. If I have three carbon here, I will need three carbon there. So uh, tricky, we get you to do bouncing in grade 10 and you're going to learn why we have you go through all that practice um, because it's really important. So now I know the ratios of each compound in this chemical equation and that's going to be really important. Um, and we're going to focus, the whole idea behind us doing this is because we want to quantify this, how much carbon dioxide we're going to produce. Now, in order to answer that question, we have to ask ourselves, well, how much iron do I need? Typically, the mass of a average uh, car in Canada and the U.S. in terms of iron is about 820 kilograms of iron going into it. Now, whenever we want to work with stoichiometry, which is what we're doing here, we're trying to figure out amounts and chemical equations, we don't uh, leave things in kilograms. We always have to convert to grams. We're going to figure out why that is in a second. So I know there's a thousand grams in a kilogram, so I would multiply my 820 by a thousand, and that would give me, of course, 820,000 grams. So this is a good starting point here. I now know my mass of iron that I need in order to make my car. And uh, so now I have to figure out, well, how much carbon dioxide am I going to need? Now some people might say, oh, I see a ratio here, a 4 to 3 ratio. Um, will that ratio work? by mass. Should I multiply my mass of iron here by 3 and then divide by 4? Not the case. Uh, there are relationships between masses uh, in, in chemical reactions, but the 4 and the 3 represent the ratios in terms of 
the particles. So four particles of iron get produced in this uh, chemical equation. Um, and we get three sets of carbon dioxide molecules uh, being uh, um, produced in this reaction. And so my ratio at the molecular level is 4 to 3. This isn't a ratio at the mass level. So we need to be able to convert from the molecular level to the mass level. And it turns out that uh, there's a neat, uh, a neat trick in nature. If we go back to our friend the periodic table, uh, we need to take a quick look at chemical, the mass of iron. That iron has a has atomic mass. Um, you might have heard a teachers refer to that as the molar mass, probably. Uh, in in grade 9 or 10, but you might have heard that, a slip, say, from if you have a teacher that was more chemistry-based. That there's a neat um, pattern in nature that if I take the atomic mass of any element, I get a specific number of particles that um, of that element. And it turns out that if I have 55.847 grams of iron, that means I have 6.022 times 10 23rd atoms. Of iron. The relationship uh, discovered by uh, a gentleman named Avogadro. I uh, remember he didn't actually come up with the number himself. Apparently, the, uh, the actual number came a little bit later. Uh, this number at the top right here is a very important number. It's one of those weird relationships in nature that. It's sort of like a dozen eggs, and that's probably the best way to think about this. We call this the mole. One, one mole. If I have one mole of substance, the mass of that substance would be the same as the atomic mass. Um, and if I have a, if I have an element, if I found the one mole of a compound would be the all the atomic atomic masses found in that compound and um, and that always gives set number it's a really big number 6 times 2 2 times point zero two two times 10 to the 23rd um, that's more atoms than you count in a lifetime uh, so it as a dozen eggs um, if I have a mole a set number and so now we have this relation between my atomic mass, which I'm going to do as the molar mass, and the number of atoms. So the mass of whatever um, whatever substance I have and mass, I can figure out the actual number of particles um, that. Uh, substance and there's a direct relationship in which equals number of moles n is equal to the, the uh, mass in grams of your substance molar mass and that's uh, the units for molar mass is grams per mole. If we do a little bit of fancy um, see, uh, uh, math, we'll, and we take a look at these units, if I'm um, grams by a fraction, I end up having this bottom fraction in it and it multiplies. So it becomes the grams on top, grams on bottom cancel out. 
And so this is a really neat little trick uh, in nature. And so for this, um, it actually be becomes pretty simple. All we need to know is the of three elements, carbon and oxygen. So uh, iron eight four seven seven uh, grams per mole. If I have fifty five point eight four seven grams of iron, I have one mole of iron, um, and I know the egg of atoms of iron that I'm dealing with. So because is we know our mass of iron here, and so once we know mass, we can we might pretty easily write in molar mass. And I'm always going to uh, abbreviate m dot mass as my molar mass, and my molar mass fifty five point, and I'm going to round up. In grade and in our grade, grade eleven here, we uh, I don't mind you rounding up to the second uh, digit, and um, maybe I'll move all this stuff over just a bit so I have enough room for my work later. Shrink. There we go. Okay, back at her. My molar mass, and again, I know that my number of moles is equal to the mass divided by the molar mass. And so I can do this quick calculation and I find out that eight, uh, 820,000 grams of iron is 14,682.18 moles of iron. Uh, um, and if I took this number and multiplied it by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, I could actually figure out the number of atoms of iron. We don't need to bother going that far. We can work with uh, moles now. Um, we don't actually have to know the exact number of particles. Now, <clears throat> we're not quite done. What we have to do is go back and take a look. We have our 4 and our 3. And these guys represent the number of parts, four parts iron to three parts carbon dioxide. And that actually helps us develop our molar ratio, which is extremely important. So we have a ratio of four parts iron to three parts um, carbon dioxide. And so in order to determine the number of moles of carbon dioxide, um, we can do a simple ratio. Um, calculation. So I'm just going to do that right here. So I know that over carbon dioxide is equal to 4 divided by 3. And I know my number of iron, uh, my number of moles of iron, 14,682.18. And that is over my unknown. I need to figure out my number of moles of carbon dioxide. So I remember we can cross multiply things. So the x will come up here, and the 3 will go there, and the 4 will go back down. So just some really simple cross multiplication. So I'm left with x is equal to 14,600. 82.18 moles. Make you always put your units in when you do these. I sometimes forget. Um, and that's divide by 4 times 3. And I will get a number 11,011.64 moles. We do a quick sand check here. Well, 4 is bigger than 3, so I need to have more iron than carbon dioxide in terms of moles. And uh, 14,000 is larger than 1,000. So it looks like we're on the right track. So I now know my number of moles of carbon dioxide, 11,011.64 moles. Well, I'm almost done here. Our next step, and I always like to set my, uh, my work up.
like you see here. So if I work, I always like going from mass to molar mass to moles, setting it up this way, and then I work back up the same way. That might freak some people out. It's up to you. Um, but I like to keep everything nice and organized that way. So what's my molar mass of carbon dioxide? Well, my molar mass of carbon is 12.01. And I have oxygen, but I have two oxygens I have to worry about. So I have to add both of those molar masses up. So 16 for oxygen and another 16 for oxygen, rounded up from 15.999. And that gives me... 44 grams per mole. So if I have 44 grams of carbon dioxide, I have a mole. I have 6.022 times 10 to 23 particles of carbon dioxide. Uh, so now I need, I can figure out my mass. And uh, to do that, I just um, again use my uh, chem my formula. I know that moles is mass divided by molar mass, so mass is just going to be moles times my molar mass. When I put a little dot like that, that's a way I could, I guess, have used a, uh, used a time symbol. So this is equal to a multiplication symbol. Same thing. Just cut down in space, I guess. So I have 11,011.64 moles times 44 grams per mole. If this, I have moles on the bottom, moles on the top, they cancel out. I'm left with grams. Yippee, I know that I'm on the right track. So now I get uh, my final answer of. 484,512.09 grams. So that's my mass, 484,512 grams. Now, to finish it off, let's put it back into more macro sized uh, terms. Uh, so we're going to convert into kilograms and uh, I'll round up. So that's 485 kilograms. So if I produce and if I need to make 820 kilograms of steel for my first car, uh, that means I'm also on top of that going to produce 485 kilograms of carbon dioxide just to remove the oxygen from the iron in order to uh, to produce the steel. So just that chemical uh, reaction. I haven't taken into account yet the energy required um, to produce this, either in terms of transportation, uh, burning of fossil fuels, producing a carbon dioxide, um, maybe burning uh, natural gas or coal to produce the electricity that the plant uses. So there's a lot of things I haven't taken into consideration. So just the basic chemistry of taking your hematite and converting it to iron uh, produces uh, 485 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Average person in the US probably weighs about 65 kilograms. <clears throat> so you can do the math. That's a, a lot of people worth of carbon dioxide. Um, almost half of your car's mass um, in, uh, in terms of carbon dioxide produced. So now we can apply this same system to determining carbon footprints of many other um, reactions. And this reaction where we remove an oxygen uh, from a metal uh, using a carbon in a blast furnace is called a smelting reaction. And we will be uh, taking a look at many other types of smelting reactions. Um, our next couple lessons, we're going to take a look at the burning of fossil fuels to produce 
uh, the electricity or or power the vehicles and we will be able to go a little bit further and um, start to look at the cumulative total of carbon dioxide produced in order to make your first car or produce the aluminum for pop cans and things like that.